welcome back to another edition of Church Rebirth Ministries Ministry Online. I confess it's been a month since I sat in this chair or any chair and just actually preached. Uh, one time during the month of August, I spoke at our home church, Somerville Baptist, and we posted that video in lieu. But the rest of the time I've been doing interviews, it's because circumstances has just provided those opportunities. And one of my challenges is as we share this journey and as I'm trying to continue to sort out what God is saying and doing and leading me to do, um, and, and I felt led to start doing the interviews with pastors that had effectively been used in, in transforming churches or transitioning churches as a part of our journey. And then we, we ventured away from that sort of as a bridge when I interviewed my younger brother. I appreciate all the feedback I've received on that. That's the most fun interview I've, I've ever done and may ever do. And we only uh, touch the, the tip of the iceberg. And then it wasn't long after that, my, my closest friend from 50 years ago when he was a new believer, Doug Reagan, came and spent a week with us and grateful for that. And in realizing his journey was so different that I felt compelled that I, I, wanted, I wanted you to be able to, to, to meet him and to hear his story because he has had such a profound influence on my life. And then last week, many of you have been tracking us long enough to know that was the anniversary of the, the death of our daughter-in-law, Susan. And I've been praying about the opportunity because those of you have, who have um, had to walk through the valley of the shadow of death with somebody real close to you, it could be a spouse, it could be a child, it could be a parent, it could be a sibling, but somebody that, that's just a very much a part of your world when they've been separated by death and, and it challenges everything about your being emotionally, mentally, and certainly spiritually. And to have watched my son go through this last 12 months and our grandson, I just felt compelled that um, Jonathan needed to speak for himself. And so while my brother's was the most fun and enjoyable interview to do, the one with Jonathan was not. It, it was very difficult, but I felt like it was necessary. And I'm confident that the Lord is even using it now. And I appreciate his courage to be able to, to walk through that and share that as well. Continue to pray for them because it's, it's not easy. It's not going to be easy. It may never be easy, but God's grace will sort of blunt the edges as we go forward in time. So we, we come back to our sort of our normal routine. I am going to be speaking in uh, the Pleasant Grove Baptist Church on September the 15th and 25th. Uh, please be in prayer for that church. They're very much on the cusp of non-existence. And I'm hoping to have a conversation with them to see where we go with that. And I'll be posting those videos in lieu of a, a, a normal, you know, midweek, midweek teaching session. So for, for today, I've been thinking through for the last week or so, I guess it's been two weeks since I, I, I saw the news. And some of you may have seen it as well, because it, it, made, it made the national news. Anytime a preacher, a high profile preacher, certainly a con conservative evangelical Southern Baptist in this case, um, has to admit to something that was not not necessarily wrong, but not necessarily the right thing to do. It it gains national attention, and on the you know on on the left, it provides people who despise Christianity and evangelicals, you know, more more opportunity to just pick up rocks and say I told you so kind of thing. I, I you know those people just just ignore them and pray for them. Uh, they they can't help who they are and what they think. So anyway, Matt Chandler uh, is the lead pastor of the Village Church, which is a, a, a mega church on the outskirts of the Dallas-Fort Worth metropolitan area. And um, so two weeks ago, I think it was, uh, after one of his other lead pastors did the preaching, he came out on stage, as per this image, and he essentially announced that um, he, in agreement with his leadership team, thought it best that he take a brief leave of absence for personal assessment to regroup to find some healing before he resumes the leadership role in that church. And, and I, I encourage you to go to YouTube and, and watch it and listen to it for, for yourself because I don't want to put words in his mouth. But essentially he said that he was approached one Sunday morning a, a, after a service by one of his members who said she had a very close friend who had been in exchange with the pastor on social media. And so this lady that approached him said, I, I don't feel like your conversations with her 
have been appropriate. And it caused Matt to pause and think about what had transpired. And, uh, and he agreed that, that probably it was not the best thing in the world. Now, there was nothing salacious. There was nothing sexual. There was nothing wrong about the content of their exchanges. And I'm sure in time, they'll, those will be posted for everybody to pick apart and you know, try to interpret. But essentially, it was the fact that of the frequency of the exchanges and, and the familiarity of the exchanges between a lead pastor and simply a member of, of the flock. And for that reason, they felt in the interest of of honesty and integrity and transparency for Matt to say, you know, however right or wrong it was, I, I agree, I, I just wasn't being cautious enough. I wasn't being careful enough, wasn't thinking through the implications. And so evidently I need to step back and sort of catch my breath and, and renew. And, and so for that reason, I wanted to, to take this week's time with you to talk about, uh, talk about boundaries. Because those are the issues in, in believers' lives that uh, pose some of the greatest challenges. And in this case, it happened to be a lead pastor, a high-profile, successful lead pastor. Uh, but it, for the rest of you, it, it's, it's a challenge in your own life because boundaries are those, those acknowledged necessary limitations that we accept that we need in our lives. We need to honor and respect because of, of either the risk or the hazard or the dangers or the implications or the suggestion that something is, is certainly not right. And so it poses a challenge because we want to avoid legalism, that is putting up hard fences everywhere in a person's life so that there's no latitude of discernment or, or, or interpretation or circumstances to be taken into account. And, and legalism never really serves any great purpose except to, to, to handcuff us and to say, this is not about your freedom in Christ to express your love for Him because you want to. This is about simply crossing the T's and dotting the I's and, and making everything right. So I, I want to use sort of as a backdrop for my thoughts today. I, I don't have a, a prepared outline that I'm looking at. I've just been processing and processing. And because of life schedule, I just wanted to come to you from my heart this week and, and to talk about this particular issue. And, and so the passage I thought about uh, in, in framing the situation that Matt Chandler found himself in, that the church finds itself in there, and that we are dealing with, is out of John chapter 4. And just indulge me, as you always have to, because when I read a passage and you're going, you know, how does that fit into this picture? Bear with me, and, and we will help make sense out of it for you. So John chapter 4, verse 1. So then, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that He was making and baptizing more disciples than John, Although Jesus himself was not baptizing, rather his disciples were, he left Judea and went away again to Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of the land that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, tired from his journey, was just sitting by the well. It was about the sixth hour, about noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away to the city to buy food. So the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, though you are a Jew, are asking me for a drink, though I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Now, I, I, could, I could read more of, of this passage, but in the interest of time and for the point at, at hand for us, I mean, there's so many different things that we could do with this passage that don't have to do with this subject matter of, of boundaries. The, the, the fact that Jesus is having to deal with what people are hearing and saying and thinking, uh, it was simply a reality of His day. It's been the reality of every day and every culture. You have to take that into account whether what people say and repeat and believe is true or not. And so consequently, in the, in the journeys with he and his disciples, they're going from Judea back to, to Galilee, and they, they pass through Samaria. Uh, Samaria was, was a land that was occupied by a, a group of people that were, that were half Jewish and half other. Um, they, they were considered half-breeds, and so therefore they, they were outcast on both sides. The, the Greeks or the, 
the, the other Gentiles in the area because they were half Jewish. They didn't want anything to do with them. The Jews didn't want to have anything to do with them because they were not pure Jews on both sides of the, uh, of the uh, DNA code. So they, they had, were living in isolation and in separation. They had their own community. And geographically, it just simply was more convenient for Jesus and his disciples to, to pass through there. And about noon, uh, they're outside of town. They're, they stop at a well. And of course, the other context here that we don't go into is that, that the thing that Jesus uh, knew that, that people had heard was that, that Jesus um, was baptizing more disciples than, than John. Go, go figure. Uh, people in, in positions of sp spiritual responsibility think it's a contest or it's a competition. Who, who does the most? Who does the greatest? You know, number one, that's beside the point. We're not even going to go there. But th the real point here is that, that it, the scripture clarified and said, but it was not Jesus who was baptizing. It was his disciples. You know, the annotated footnote there is that baptism is not the most important thing in a believer's life. And for churches that want to make it that, and therefore they, you know, they, they, they herd people into the trough to get them through and say, oh, you're baptized, welcome to the kingdom. Uh, you know, that's not supported in scripture. Uh, baptism was the most important thing in Jesus' ministry. It was important, not the most important. But that's beside our point today. So they're, they're, they're passing through. He's tired. They're tired. He stops at a well midday, and the disciples go into the city to buy food. You know, they, they weren't carrying backpacks. They didn't have, you know, lunch pails. That it was, hand, it was literally hand to mouth. That you went, you found food wherever you were. It, it's like in, in much of the world, even now, uh, either in Europe and third world countries, quite often families, they don't, they don't keep a great stock of food and inventory in their homes on the way home from work during the day, they'll stop at the market. They'll buy bread, they'll buy meat, they'll buy certain things to have food. So this was a common practice. But anyway, so the disciples go into town. Jesus is sitting there at the well, just resting himself. Another footnote, it simply shows the humanity of Jesus. He was fully God, he was fully man. He was fully man enough to know his feet hurt, his back hurt, he was tired, he was thirsty, he was hungry. That's because he was human too. And while he's sitting there, then a stranger approaches him a woman comes to the well, which is the reason that we know this account as the account of the what the, the woman at the well, better known as the Samaritan woman. And so she comes there in the middle of the day by herself to, to get water. Now we could go into the background and say, well, why was she by herself at that point in time going out there? Because typically women in a community went out and did those things together for fellowship and for protection. They would do that. But she's not with a crowd of other women. She is by herself. We see later on in the account why that was probably true. So she finds this strange Jewish man sitting there at the well. She's getting her water and he looks at her and says, would you mind giving me a drink? Now, for you and I in Western civilization in 2022 would think, what's the big screaming deal here? He's a man, he's thirsty, they're at a water hole, she has something to get water with. He simply asks for the courtesy of, of having a drink. Uh, there was far more to it than that, and she frames it in the question that we have not moved beyond in our reading. She was, it struck her as odd. And so she says, I, I, why is it that you a Jew or asking water of me, a Samaritan woman. She didn't just say a Samaritan, she said a Samaritan woman. So she acknowledged the difficulties in the relationship between the Jews as a nation and, and the Samaritans as a nation, as a people, which was interesting enough and challenging enough in that moment. But then she adds that gender component in this. She says, you know, why are you asking me of a woman? You know, this was a lesson that I, I got to see firsthand when I was in Turkey back in 2010. Spent almost 10 days in the country with some other pastor friends, being hosted by Turkish families, uh, being treated to lunch in the marketplaces and the places around, we toured all over the country. And when we were in the homes of, uh, we were in the, in the home of a very a uh, successful businessman. He had, his house was actually in a compound. You drove through a big gate. He had a big parking area out there, and it was it was a, it was a large house. And 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 the the men and the women don't eat together. Uh, they the the men essentially eat at the dining room table, the big table, and the women eat in the kitchen or wait in the kitchen. And and it was explained to us in that culture that a man never speaks to a woman 
without asking permission of her family member or her husband, or in some cases the brother, because the woman was always under that authority. And it was considered improper or rude or even bad to engage a conversation with somebody of the opposite sex. And so we understood that and recognized that and honored that. It didn't mean that women weren't invited into the conversations. And my wife and I had attended some iftar dinners uh, in Silver Springs with, with the, the group of Muslims there. And, and it, was, it, was, it was like a Baptist fellowship. You know, there were families sitting at tables, husbands and wives together, and kids running all over the way in place and bouncing off the walls. And, and so we're sitting at table and having friendly dinner conversation. It was the context of the moment. It was okay there. It was not okay in Turkey. That is sort of the situation you have with Jesus here, that, that this woman is recognizing that there, there are boundaries, that culturally, that everybody knows what those are, and you just go along to get along, to play by the rules. And so it struck her, how, how did a Jew uh, feel comfortable violating that protocol of having a conversation with a Samaritan? And then how was it that a Jewish man violated the protocol, the boundaries of having a conversation with a non-Jewish woman? And I, I use that as the backdrop because, um, because even in our day, we know that there are some high profile, even politician, Mike Pence for one, who took a lot of heat when he's vice president under Trump for saying that, that he would not eat alone with a woman other than his wife. And, and the, the press just ripped him apart and people made jokes about him and comedians made, made fun of him. But he did that for a good reason. For him, it's like, I never wanted to be in a position where somebody can accuse me of something that's not true, so I'm never going to be in that position that they can make that accusation. It will be on record. You'll know where I am. You'll know who I'm with. I, I simply can't do that. Or even some, some wiser, you know, pastors of our generation, Rick Warren, for example, of the Saddleback Church. You know, here's a, here's a, a, a man who's a, who planted and grew a, a mega church. Uh, he, he's a millionaire because he wrote the book, The Purpose Driven Life, among other books that he wrote. Just retired from his church after 40 years at the helm there. And I can remember Rick saying early, early on in, in his teaching, he says, I'm, I'm so respectful of this boundary and the potential pitfalls of not honoring it and recognizing it that that I'm, I'm so afraid of being in the context of a woman alone that I won't even ride an elevator alone with a woman. Now people laughed about that but Rick's not he's not an idiot. Uh, he knows nothing has to happen there just simply has to be a circumstance in which he can be accused that something's happened. Pastors over the years have learned in, in, in counseling sessions when a pastor had an office and, and a woman came for counseling, he would leave the office door open so the secretary could hear everything that was said. If he was a smart counselor, he would do that. You know, all that's fine and good, and I understand that. And, and, and more preachers ought to do that, and we would have less of the bad press that we've gotten across denominational lines. There, there, there is no denomination that's been exempted from, from this problem of, of, of men pastors uh, conducting themselves in ways that are that are morally wrong or suspect or questionable. Many times th they are drop dead guilty of having crossed those lines. And many times they're not, but they have simply been accused by somebody who's not happy with the outcome. And, and because they can't prove it's not true, uh, in, 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 that con in that cultural context, you're not innocent until proven guilty. You are suspect and therefore you may be guilty unless you can prove your innocence. And in that case, you simply cannot. So the question comes, I, I thought about the Matt Chandler situation, and, and, and let me sort of back up and, and give a little ramp up to this and, and why I was even paying attention to, to Matt Chandler. I did not know who he was. He's 48 years old. Uh, he was from the part of the country that I left to, to go to Maryland and to minister there. And, and over those intervening years while I was there, because he was much younger, he, he went into a church and, and, and the Lord blessed it. He, he grew a church to a large size and then they started going multi-site, uh, taking other churches in. And, and so the, he had several campuses in north of the De Dallas Fort Ro Met metropolitan area that they were doing ministry. It was tr streaming ministry, video ministry. And so he was preaching at the main campus and they were streaming that to the other campus, very large ultra conservative, super, super conservative, more so than, than most, and yet it didn't stand in the way of his succeeding 
as a lead pastor in reaching people. And, and, and they did baptize a lot of people. And he was very strict about who could be a, a member, what, what all they had to sign off on. And, and I was just utterly amazed because, you know, he and I, I'm happy to say that theologically, he agreed with me on everything. <laughs> I'm sure that made his life much, much happier. But anyway, so in, in 2007, as we were exploring multi-site ministry, um, I'm in Glen Burnie at North Ronald Church. We, you know, we've gone the circuit of multi-services and relocating, and multi-services and relocating, and we're just out of room, and you know, you can't buy anything, can't afford anything, and so we're looking at options. and And I, I stumbled onto the idea, or I read about it, or somebody suggested that this whole business of doing multi-site. Now I didn't know what that was, and so I I did what I always did. I did my research. I started reading about it. And, and that summer, uh, I had the opportunity, 2007, to visit two different churches that had just started doing that. One of those was Seacoast in, in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. They had multiple campuses in this area. And I got to attend one of those and went, wow, that uh, it really does work. And that summer, uh, going back to the Dallas-Fort Worth metropolitan area, spent some time over there a weekend at Fellowship Church uh, out of Arlington had launched a couple of campuses. One of those was in Plano, and so I went over there for a Saturday night to watch that whole experience, and I came away going, it, it, it works. You, you may say you don't like it, you don't want to watch a preacher on a screen, but when it's done well, people forget that they're watching a screen. They interact with that person on the screen as though he were live. And, uh, and, and because we were exploring that, I was granted some scholarship money by the North American Mission Board at that time because we were looking at doing that in the Baltimore region to go and explore and get an education about multi-site ministry. I came to, you know, Charleston, South Carolina to, to attend a conference with Seacoast Church. I went to, to uh, Chicago, Illinois to, to visit a church there that was doing multi-site in a very different way. And then I flew to, to Dallas, Texas, and I attended a conference there where Matt Chandler was one of the, one of the speakers. So that was my first exposure to him. And so he sort of got on my radar and, and I was impressed and I appreciated uh, the content of his speaking, what he had, he had done, how, how, how well structured he was. Uh, he wasn't playing games and giving things away. It was bona fide ministry that was making an impact. So that was 2007, 2008. It wasn't long after that, I don't remember exactly what year, and I've not gone back this year to document that, where I noticed online he had posted a video where he had been diagnosed with a brain tumor. And what he did, it started like at the end of the year, whether it was like October or November, and as he went through the surgery and the chemo treatment that followed that, he took his church family through that spiritual journey. Because here's real flesh and blood, a spiritual leader in a church that's highly recognized, respected, and loved, facing the most daunting thing in life, his own mortality. And, and there was no guarantee that the surgery to remove the tumor would be successful. There was no guarantee that the follow-up chemo would be successful. And so he wanted to document and demonstrate that God is faithful even through that journey. And so I would log on week by week and, and watch what he had to say from pre-surgery to after surgery where he had this you know, giant scar on his shaved head that still had the, the staples in it to the, the, the stages where the hair was going back and he was going through the, the chemotherapy and, and he got past that into the next year and, and it took a while, but he resumed his responsibilities in the church. And I just tried, and I admired him. I respected the courage that he had to do that and, the, and to demonstrate God's faithfulness under the most trying of circumstances. And, and God was honoring that. I mean, the church was being blessed and continued to grow and people praying for him. And, but, but something happened uh, as a result of that that changed sort of his leadership, um, the, the tone or the, the temper of their services because they'd been riding a, a huge wave of success. And, and some of us that watched, have watched this phenomenon, the, the guys that come from nowhere and God blesses their ministry and they achieve almost a celebrity status, more times than not, it ruins those men. You know, they start, they start acting like celebrities, they start dressing like ce celebrities, they start getting, you know, body art all over them like celebrities, and, and they're treated like celebrities, and, and unfortunately it goes to their head. Um, 
and a train wreck is not too far away. And, and I don't know that, that Matt ever was that person, but I know that he was in that arena where that was, that was a high probability of taking place. But, because how can you say, oh, don't adore me. <laughs> don't tell me how good I am. Don't pay me well because I'm serving God faithfully. Don't, you know, you know you're, you're, you're grateful because you could be in Podunk Holland and nobody knows about with, you know, 10 people in a, in a dying church and saying, what more can I do? But that was not the case with Matt. And, uh, so right after that, my, my younger brother, Rocky, that you met a few weeks back in interview, he was friends with one of the staff members on, on, on the village church. And, he, and he, 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 had a, he had lunch with him one day after that. And, and so he asked me, he said, so how, how, is, how, is, how are things different at church since Matt returned from his brush with death and cancer? And the, the staffer said to my brother, Rocky, he said, it's not nearly as much fun as it used to be. And now you can interpret that any way you want, but I, I know that for Matt, it really was a wake-up call that says, maybe, maybe we've been treating with a little bit too much lightness and levity this thing that God is doing here. And, and we're, making, we're having really too much fun when it's not about having fun, it's about honoring God and being faithful and enjoying that process and blessing. But, but somehow we, we, need to, we need to be more focused on the spiritual component, enjoy it, thank God for it, but we need to, and so it altered because he realized that, that sense of mortality had come. Because like the rest of us, you know, when you're, when you're a teenager, certainly, when you're a 20 something or a 30 something, there, there is that, that sense of immortality that you have because you still feel young and strong and vibrant and healthy and you just can't imagine anything else nothing certain is going to go wrong if you you know if you you look at matt he's he's thin as a rail he eats right he exercises right he takes care of his health i mean does all those things and to think this is a ride that can go on indefinitely but then when you have that brush with death and you come back from that then you assess everything in your life and say you know what Am I really conducting myself? Am I really leading in such a way that it's not about how much fun I can make out of it, but how much I can glorify God through it and effectively reach and minister to people? And so you make those, those adjustments that may seem subtle to you, but to those people who, who liked it when it was fun and, and when it was a lot of laughs and when you were celebrating success and those kind of things, for them, it, it, it's like a, a stark contrast. And so it wasn't nearly as much fun. And so he took on a little bit more serious note. He made some adjustments after that. They started uh, sending off their other campuses as autonomous churches because he said, this can't be about me. This can't be about Matt Chandler, my personality, my being the guy on the screen. Ministry needs to be done in those places by those people under a different leadership. And so he did that, which was a huge move on his part. And then he was interviewed, uh, I quoted this, you know, a lot of years ago, he was interviewed by a Christian publication during that season. And they asked him, they said, Matt, you know, knowing now that uh, there, you have no guarantee that the cancer will not recur, because once you've, once you've had uh, cancer of the brain, then for a long time after that, you, you go every six months, have spinal fluid drawn to examine to see if there are any, uh, any new cancer cells there. Because it's a wait and watch. Because statistically, there's a higher percentage of people that it, it, it returns than that it does not. And so the question that was asked of him by the journalist was, so, so Matt, are, are you concerned if, if cancer were to return and you were not to live, are you concerned about your legacy at this point? And, and this, I think, is where I gained the greatest respect for Matt Chandler that I could in anything I'd seen or heard to that date. He said, my legacy does not matter at all, and I'm not concerned. He said, because the people that are in the kingdom now will still be in the kingdom when I'm gone, and nothing will undo what God has done. So this is not about me or my legacy. And so I wanted to applaud and say, Matt, you know, I wish every Every megachurch pastor in America, every high profile pastor in America could take on that sort of uh, attitude about yourself and your relevance and your value to the grand scheme of things, that we're all getting to do what we do by grace. The fact that the Lord should put one in a large place and put somebody else in a small place, that's not on them, that's what God has done for them. And they ought to celebrate who they are and where they are and what God has done. And, and when, when the time comes and you know, your number comes up and it's over, it's over with.
And so you want to do the most while you can as you have opportunity and then just celebrate what God has done. And when you're gone, you leave it to somebody else. It, it, it's like, you know, the, the old thing about, uh, you know, the, the, the one who dies with the most toy wins the competition, but they still die and everybody leaves their toys behind. So that was, that was, you know, that was probably, you know, 10, 12 years ago when that happened. And, and so here we are, Matt standing on stage, having to tell his people, this is what happened. And now I'm pulling myself back. So let me, let me sort of bring this in for sort of a framework for our purposes here is that, you know, we, we all do need boundaries. We, we're, we're imperfect. We're flesh and blood. We live in an imperfect world with a bunch of other imperfect people. And, and try as we will our best, we're always at risk of doing something or even not doing something, putting ourselves at risk for even being accused of doing something is wrong. And so we need to set clear boundaries in our lives, in our relationships, in our conversations, because it's only when we do that that we gain the credibility that we need in order to share the gospel. So it's like all those people in, in my life here that I've building, been building relationships with now for, for what, uh, five years since since I retired in 2017. So it's not it's not just people in the churches that I go to. It's not just the pastor friends that I have, but it's the people that in the culture that I have built relationships with. Because you know, Jesus isn't just about a holy huddle of the saints. It's about taking salt and light and and, and dispersing that, being the being the bread of heaven that that feeds a hungry soul. And so I know that in all my relationships, it's not just with men. It's also with women that. You know, I have to have boundaries in place so they recognize that I have boundaries. There are some things I'm simply not going to do, some places I'm simply not going to go. And, and they need to recognize that. And, and so that the question may come up, well, why don't you do that? And I have a really good explanation is I don't want anything to cause somebody else to think or suspect that I have stumbled and fallen. I don't have to be guilty of any of it, but if somebody suspects that, if I'm not even above suspicion, then the credibility of sharing the gospel is completely lost. On the other hand, and this is probably the more challenging thing here, is like Jesus with a woman at the well. If we go back and, and flesh out this story, you know, Jesus has a spiritual conversation with her and, and, and explains to her that, you know, he is the bread of heaven. He is the Messiah. He is the water of life. He's all those kind of things. And, and, um, and she 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 leaves <laughs> she leaves her, her water bucket there her jar there and she hurries back into town you know because Jesus has has told her without her knowing how he knew that that she was no she wasn't a married woman now she she'd been married seven times thank you and she was living with somebody she wasn't married to and of course the fact that he knew that you know <laughs> that that had to be mind boggling to her and so she goes back into town. And the town follows her back out to the place of Jesus. She went back and said to them, come meet a man that told me everything that I had done. Is this not the Messiah? Now, in contrast, and I don't have time to deal with this. There were, there were 12 disciples who went into town and all they came back with was food. One woman where a man, what, stepped out of those boundaries and shared the bread of life to her, he happened to be Jesus, that she was transformed. She went back and she brought the town back to Jesus. There are times when boundaries are not, are not they're, they're an inconvenience. And there's sometimes you have to do what you have to do because it's a God's appointed time to do that. And you just have to trust the outcome and the fallout to the grace and the protection of the Holy Spirit. Because I can't, I can't imagine Jesus saying to that woman, don't speak to me, don't touch me, don't get close to me. I've got to guard my reputation. I'm going to go over here and sit in the shade of a tree. You take care of your water, and when you're done, I'll, I'll come back over here. Why? Because she was a woman in need. She didn't need just physical water. She needed the living water. And Jesus was willing to risk all that was at stake in that moment because the need outweighed the risk. I know that in, in all my years of ministry, I have, you talk about 
treading on thin ice in, in this framework. Um, because certainly in, in, in Maryland, when I'm there trying to do ministry in a, in a, a really a pagan culture and trying to reach people that, that know nothing about Jesus and, and, and to go and connect with them when and where I can, it, it, it simply was not convenient or expedient to try to arrange a perfect scenario so there were no risk factors involved. And, and I knew all the rules and I knew all of the risk. And yet I was so compelled and driven by the fact that there are people that need Jesus that the only time I will have a chance to minister to them and offer them the bread of life is in a context and a moment when all the boundary makers would say, don't do that, don't go there. And I would say, I understood. But because of me, the gospel, the compelling interest of the gospel, and that person who was hungry and thirsty far outweighed those, those boundaries that other people would put in place. There are times when you have to take the risk and trust the Spirit of God to protect you from things that might happen. And then you can all go forward and celebrate the fact that God was faithful and you were not accused of anything. Uh, you know, it, it could be, I'm, I'm, I don't have a problem with saying, well, you know, those, those women that I encountered in Maryland and I had those private conversations in a private context with them is that, you know, it was a safe bet because I was too ugly for anybody to believe anything that happened. <laughs> I, just indulge my, my, my humor. But I, I knew then and, and I know now. It doesn't mean to be, to, to be without caution to say it doesn't matter, God's going to always protect you. But there are times and circumstances when you simply have to do what the Spirit God says needs to be done in that time and in that place. And the relationship, this is a note I want to, uh, I want to end on, because the relationship between spiritual leaders and the people in church needs to be a symbiotic relationship. It doesn't mean to be a codependent relationship, it needs to be a symbiotic relationship, where, where there, there are benefits that both derive from the relationship. Where, where the people aren't treated like sheep, they're treated like people in need of God's grace. And a pastor isn't treated like a celebrity. He's not held up as an idol, is, is incapable of making mistake, uh, that, that he is fully human, but fully called of God, that there needs to come to that relationship where there's a, there's a mutual respect and accountability on the part of each one of them. So I would say in the, in the Matt Chandler case, I, I, you know, I, my thoughts were that this, this is a great teaching moment for he and the church to say, you know, because nothing, nothing wicked or evil took place, let's talk about what did take place. And, and let's, let's learn from those lessons about what did take place and why th that wasn't the wisest thing to do and how I need to be more guarded and we need to be more guarded so that we, we continue to love each other with mutual respect in the framework of life and living life. But knowing that the enemy just waits for every opportunity to take advantage, to discredit the gospel, and to discredit us. Let me pray for us, and then we'll wrap this up on a final note. So, Father, I thank you that um, I thank you. There are people like Matt Chandler who have not disgraced you at all, have not brought disgrace upon the gospel or on the cross, but they've recognized that that they were in a, in a, in a danger zone, and they weren't. They were not even sensitive to that danger zone, and, and grateful that he was able to pull back from that. And the leadership of the church said, "You know, this is not one and done. This is, you know, take a breather." Restore yourself, regather yourself, and come back and let's resume this journey. Wiser as a result of the grace of the Spirit who's allowed us to come to this place. And so for those who are listening to the sound of, of my voice, uh, whether they're, they're a part of a church that's struggling to find spiritual leadership, whether somebody that's struggling to find a church, wh whoever it happens to be, Lord, that they can, they can go into those environments in the context knowing that there are no perfect churches and there are no perfect pastors <laughs> because there are no perfect people that we're all imperfect, but we're made complete by the blood of Jesus and by His grace. But He calls us to a stewardship of being wise in that process. So thank you for gracing us with being able to learn from our mistakes and having a new opportunity on a new day. I commit these to you that hear the sound of my voice. Help them as they find their place and their role in those conversations, in those relationships. It's in Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Well, thank you for coming back and, and being a part of this, this week. Um, continue to pray for us as we 
you know, continue to try to build relationships and serve here. The church that I'm, I'm, we're members of right now, Somerville Baptist, is launching a, a, a second campus on September the 11th, and we're going to be a part of that launch. And in the following two weeks, I'm going to be preaching, so be in prayer as, as I do those relationships. If you have suggestions or questions or comments, I, I appreciate the comments that I've received uh, on, the, on the interview videos. Uh, people that know these people in my life and comment. I appreciate that. That's an encouragement to me. Or if you have questions or suggestions, then contact me at this email address. Let me hear from you uh, and invite others. I, I see that on occasion somebody has shared the, the video post so that so that it goes far and wide and I'm getting some interesting you know, contacts from really around the world and I'm grateful for that. I just want it to be used of God and for whatever he has next. And I, I appreciate those that support the ministry financially that enable us to have what we have in terms of the equipment and when I have to have travel expenses involved in going to these places and doing these interviews and, and, and that helps defray those costs and, um, and I appreciate that. If, if you'd like to be a part of that giving pool, there are ways to do that electronically. If you don't know how, then just let me know and I'll walk you through that. Or if you're old school, simply want to drop a check in the mail, make it out to Church Rebirth Ministries Incorporated and send it to this mailing address. We're a 501c3 organization, which means you will get an acknowledgement uh, a contribution credit uh, and you'll receive a statement at the end of the year to that end. Thank you very much. Continue to pray for us as we, we find God's place and His role in the road ahead.